In the opening scene, where Elise tries to contact the dead when she's in the bedroom with her brother, she ends up summoning a demon who appears on the bed behind her for a fraction of a second. This appears to be a younger version of the lipstick-faced demon who years later becomes the driving force behind the Lambert haunting in the original Insidious. We also see a small horse figurine in the room which resembles the one found in Lipstick Face's lair in the further. Horses may just be a recurring element in the further as we see them in Parker Crane's room as well. Elise and Christian's room also have a toy monkey which we also see in Parker's room. I have a theory on how Elise may have allowed the Lambert incident to begin due to her actions in The Last Key, which I'll get back to later on in this video. Elise's father is often seen plopped in front of the TV, but if you pay attention to what he's watching, it says a lot about his character. First, he's seen watching a documentary about Joseph Stalin and Marxism. I never paid much attention in history class, but I do know that Stalin was a communist dictator back in the USSR, and Marxism was an ideology that was the basis for communism. If you think about it, his household is a communist dictatorship, where he is the dictator. In fact, when he punishes Elise, the mother begs him not to go hard on her, but he says, don't tell me how to punish her, I punish people for a living. He also forces Elise to ignore her psychic gift and lie about the existence of spirits in their house because she's the only one with the ability, and in communism, everything is controlled by the state, or in this case, her father, and everyone's contribution must be equal. So he tries to force Elise to dumb herself down so that she can't use the power that her brother doesn't have, which is a method used by communist leaders to keep people in line and prevent an uprising. Another one of the programs he watches is Duck and Cover, which was a propaganda film shown to school children in the 1950s. It was supposed to teach them what to do if a nuclear attack hits, but really was created to give people a false sense of security as not to raise panic. I mean, come on, this is an attack on Titan. Covering your neck would not save you if a bomb went off. But in many ways, Gerald Rainier uses these tactics on his daughter by forcing Elise to ignore the presence of demons in her household. This way, she stays quiet and doesn't create hysteria with her brother and her mom when these presences are haunting them. And Gerald knows full well that these demons exist and knows of their power because he's been manipulated by the man with the keys, who forces him to keep these women locked in his basement. And let's have a closer look at this basement. It's filled with shelves of canned food, and you can spot a gas mask hanging on the wall. Maybe this basement is not not just a basement, but also a fallout shelter, somewhere where you might go to protect yourself from these communist attacks, something that probably works better than duck and cover. This shelter is where Elise is put when she defies her father's orders. The gas mask could also be a reference to how Elise first learned to communicate with the beings from the further, as we see here in the first Insidious. When she goes back to the basement as an adult, the calendar still reads September 1953, meaning her father never went back down there after losing his wife. So the fallout shelter comes to represent a resistance against communism. In fact, if you look back on major historical events in September 1953, one of the biggest stories was communist China being rejected from joining United Nations at the request of another communist nation, the Soviet Union. Plus, Gerald's prison warden outfit is very reminiscent of something you might see on a Soviet general in World War II. There's a scene early on where we see the silhouette of this jacket moving around behind Elise as she explores the basement, which is an early clue that her father was involved with the supernatural entities that resided there. The house is located at 414 Apple Tree Road in Five Keys, New Mexico. As mentioned when I talked about the trailer, it's a fictional location, so choices such as making this welcome sign look like a tombstone are deliberate. It's kind of hinted that the whole town is filled with malicious ghosts because of the executions that take place at the large prison facility, which seems to be the main feature of Five Keys. One character tells Elise that she's lucky to have gotten out of town, and her niece, Imogen, claims to have also seen these spirits, despite the fact that she never actually visited the house Elise grew up in. It seems like the whole town is plagued by these occurrences, and Elise's childhood home has the worst of it due to the close proximity with the prison. The street address, 414 Apple Tree Road, could be a reference to this being the fourth movie in the franchise leading directly into the first movie. Early on in The Last Key, Elise mentions that she refuses to go back into the further after a close call while helping out Quinn Brenner, which is a reference to her standoff with the Black Bride in Insidious Chapter 3. This explains why she will no longer astral project, because she knows the Black Bride will be there waiting for her 
her if she does. This is why she's unable to go into the further and guide Josh when he goes to retrieve Dalton in Insidious. In the last key, her mother is the one who saves her from the man with the keys. The experience gives her a newfound respect for her mother, so much so that she refuses to take ownership of the last name from that point forward. No, Mrs. Rainier is my mother, just call me Elise. Oh. It's also where she discovered that the further doesn't adhere to a linear flow of time. Elise meets and gives advice to a younger version of herself in the movie, which would seem to be the first experience she has with the further bringing together timelines in the real world. There's evidence that she knows about this in Insidious. The further is a world far beyond our own, yet it's all around us. A place without time as we know it. And it plays a much bigger part in Chapter 2, when Josh does the same thing. He meets a younger version of himself to help track down the location of the Black Bride. At the end of Insidious Chapter 3, Elise joins up with Spex and Tucker, but mentions that if they're going to go into business together, they'll need to dress nicer. In this movie, Elise gives them the new clothes, which they subsequently wear in Insidious and whenever they're on the job in Insidious Chapter 2. Elise mentions that the clothes were some of Jack's old outfits. Jack is her deceased husband, whose image can be seen in Chapter 3 when the man who can't breathe tries to trick her into taking her life by pretending to be Jack. Sure enough, the outfit he's wearing in the scene matches up with the outfits that Elise provides Spex and Tucker with, which become part of their signature look in the series going forward. It's not entirely clear how much of Elise's father's behavior is just him being evil and how much of it is due to him being controlled by the man with the keys, but we do see evidence that the key man's victims may have some control at some point. When Elise returns to the house in 2010 after Ted Garza has moved in, most of the interior decorations are the same, but Garza has added some religious symbols, a cross on the wall, and many copies of his holy bible, which he expresses a belief that it'll help Elise ward off the bad spirits, which seems to be more like something out of the exorcist than Insidious, which is why it doesn't really work. There's also a nod to another exorcism movie though. Elise's dog appears in both this film and the previous film, and his name is Warren. Ed and Lorraine Warren are Elise's ghost hunting counterparts in the Conjuring franchise, the other big four film horror series started by James Wan under the Blumhouse banner. Anna is the woman being kept prisoner in the basement. When they find her, you may notice that she has a considerable amount of leg hair, suggesting that she's been trapped down there for a very long time. When Elise goes to investigate further, she finds the suitcases of at least four other women who have been taken prisoner down there. They each contain information about the person and their skull. The one thing each victim has in common is that they're all female nurses. It's never fully explained why this key demon is only interested in nurses, but it does make me wonder if this is somehow connected to Lorraine Lambert, Josh's mother. In Chapter 2, the Black Bride first encounters Josh as a child when he's waiting for his mom to get off work at the hospital, as a nurse. Parker Crane, who ends up being the Black Bride, attacks Josh, and it's discovered that one day later, he jumped off the roof of the hospital, killing himself. Lorraine finds this out after a creepy elevator ride with Parker's ghost. Parker? What are you... You should be resting. You shouldn't be out of bed. Let me know your thoughts about the whole nurse thing in the comments. Earlier, I mentioned how I think Elise is responsible for the red-faced demon getting to Dalton Lambert in the first movie. It starts with these red doors, which we learn more about here in The Last Key. Elise mentions that she previously used a red door to go deeper into the further. She's talking about Quinn Brenner's apartment, which is an interesting case because the first time she passes through it, she's brought to the Lambert's second house, which she hasn't even been to yet. The second time, under the guide of one of the ghosts of the apartment, the same door takes her to the abandoned fifth floor of the apartment complex, which is the home of the man who can't breathe. In Insidious, Josh passes through a red door to get to the lipstick face demon's lair, and in Chapter 2, Josh, Elise, and Carl pass through a red door to get to Parker Crane's childhood room. In The Last Key, there's another red door, and it leads to the penitentiary where the man with the keys lives, and this is where the final showdown takes place. So based on these examples so far, it looks like red doors typically lead to the lair of the demon who's haunting that area. However, it would appear that there are certain cases where a red door will take someone to another time period, and we see it happen one more time when Elise is on her way back to the real world in Chapter 4. She stumbles upon the first Lambert house and sees Dalton fall off of the ladder. When she goes back through the door, she leaves it open, and the Darth Maul looking demon who has been following her all these years sees the chance to go after Dalton and try to take over his body to get back to the real world, which was his objective all along. So in many ways, the Keyfinger demon, despite being defeated, still accomplished his goal. He's been trying to get Elise to open all of these doors ever since she was a child, and she opens the one that leads the lipstick-faced demon to Dalton. The man with the keys leaves all these keys 
keys around for a lease to open the doors, but at the end of the day, the last key is a lease. So then the question becomes, why do these doors keep leading Elise back to the Lambert family? It could be the further, or someone in the further, such as Elise's mother, trying to show that this is where she meets her fate, and it's hinted at many times throughout the four films. But it doesn't do any good because the Black Bride still ends up getting the better of Elise at the end of Insidious, and the lipstick Face demon is still on the loose at the end of the continuity that we've seen so far. So, Lee Winnell, if you're watching this, it's been two movies since he gave us that cliffhanger. I think it's time in chapter five to tie this one up and give us a sequel to chapter two. Whenever that chapter five trailer does drop, you can bet I'll be covering it. Until then, remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week. Ring that death bell for notifications and I'll see you in the next one, assuming we both survive.